Welcome back to A Case of the Sunday Scaries. I'm Elise. And I'm Annie. And we have a special guest for our listeners today, so we are going to be diving right into today's episode. April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month, and I came across some pretty powerful statistics that I want to share. According to Rain.org, every 68 seconds, someone in the U.S. is sexually assaulted, and every nine minutes, one of those victims is a child. One out of every six American women have been the victim of an attempted or completed sexual assault in her lifetime. One in 33 men have experienced an attempted or completed sexual assault in their lifetime. So we are focusing today's episode on sex crimes, and we are really excited to have a guest with us today. Steve, welcome to Cases Sunday Scaries. He has been in law enforcement for over three decades, and a large portion of that time has been spent investigating hundreds, if not maybe thousands, of sexual assault cases. And this is his area of expertise. So we are just so happy to have you on Cases Sunday Scaries. Welcome, Steve. Well, thank you, Annie and Elise. And I uh, am honored to be asked to be on your podcast you know, to talk about a very serious, but could be very knowledgeable subject as well when it comes down to sexual assaults and sexual based crimes. So thank you for inviting me to uh, be on your show. Absolutely. I kind of want to kick this off because, you know, if I'm being honest, I cannot imagine as someone who cries almost every episode <laughs> truly on this podcast, just hearing other people's stories. I can't imagine what it's like to choose this as a career path. So can you take us back to the moment or maybe a case that you were working on that made you know that this is the path that you want to take to investigate this specific type of crime? I worked in law enforcement both in Florida and also here in Colorado. When I had the opportunity to become a detective and then become a major crime detective in Florida, part of that was investigating sex assault. So that's where it all started. But I think the true passion when I got to Colorado and became a detective in the major crimes unit, more importantly, specifically the sex assault unit, I started realizing that when I was speaking to victims and survivors of sexual assaults or sexual based crimes, a lot of them were asking the same questions and the questions were surrounding, you know, things like, why did I wait to come forward? Why did this happen to me? Why couldn't I fight back? And the more I heard that, and then the more I began doing research, I felt like there was a lot of great websites out there like Rain that help out victims and their allies of sexual assaults or sexual based crimes, but none of them I found go deep into what goes into the investigation or the reasons why they might have felt the way they did during the assault or why they couldn't do anything at all and why they froze and couldn't move and those type of things. And that really prompted me to want to do this because I felt that it was a need. I really did. I felt that it was a need and people needed to know. And the more I spoke to people about it, they're like, yeah, we do need to know that. And I was hearing that directly from the survivors and the victims of the sexual abuse and sexual assault crimes. Are you on the scene when something like that happens and then you stay with that victim throughout the process? How does that work? No, normally what would happen during an investigation by the time I get it, a patrol officer would have already taken a report or in some cases I would have been called out to a scene itself. And then depending on how the victim was feeling at the time, one of the things that I like to do is I like to give control back to the victim. If they don't feel like being interviewed at that time, we're not going to interview at that time. If they've been up all night because this is all that they've been talking about or worried about, I'm not going to get a very good interview from them. And we make mm -hmm. arrangements on their schedule. You know, I like to make the arrangements to just have them come in and talk to me when they're ready. And then when they are ready to, to come in and talk, then we do the interview process. And one of the things I try to do during my interview is I try to have them recall as much detail as they can, even though most of the time they won't re re recall all the detail. It's something that is a process that comes over time. Sure. And trauma makes us forget. So you're kind of this safe space to, where they can come and talk about it when they feel comfortable. I feel like Elise kind of touched upon it earlier, but we cover a lot of cases. I think back to Butcher Baker of Alaska, Karen Stitt, and then more recently, Elise's many uh, series that we're talking about. I feel like a lot of times people know the perpetrator. They know who did this to them. Is that your experience when talking to the victims, that they do know the people? Yeah, statistically over about 80%, which is pretty accurate for the investigations that I've done, about 80% know actually their perpetrator, which makes it even more difficult for them to come forward because they know the person and then they start doubting themselves and questioning what actually happened or did they cause it or what did happen? And I don't want to get this person in trouble. 
There's so many feelings and emotions that I've heard from these victims and these survivors on why they didn't come forward when they did. And it, a lot of it stems from knowing who their perpetrator is and what would happen. If it was a family member, maybe it was a teacher, what advice can you give to someone to kind of give them that little boost of you can come forward, you are in a safe space, even when it feels like the odds are completely stacked against them? One of the things uh, that I try to share with survivors of uh, sexual assault and sexual based crimes. And there's, there's definitely, you could feel the same thing, the same trauma in both of them, whether it's a sexual harassment or full blown sexual assault. What I try to explain to them is number one, by them coming forward, they become the hero saying, you know what, I've got to do something about this. Secondly, what I try to mention to them is that a lot of times this isn't the first time this person has done this. If they've done it to them, they probably have done it before. They just have never been caught. And by them coming forward, Maybe we can stop that cycle. And that's our goal. A lot of times what will happen is that they'll actually say, you know, listen, I really didn't want to come forward, but I don't want this happening to anybody else. And that's great because we just get right into a conversation about how strong they were to come forward and how this may stop the cycle. Now they're pointing the fingers to hold somebody else, the actual perpetrator accountable for his acts, which is what ultimately is the goal. When we did our mini-series covering intimate partner abuse, the same things came up a lot, which is the shame that the victim feels. But also, in telling my story and in Alice, who joined us to tell her story, which definitely involved sexual assault while she was under the influence of medications as a minor, it resonated with me how similar, even though our stories were different, how similar each of our experiences were of feeling a lot of shame of what did I do to contribute to this, but then also empowered by the knowledge of I have to do something so it doesn't happen to somebody else. Right. And so I really think that's beautiful that you speak on that because that is in a way taking your voice back when your voice and choice in this matter was taken away from you. You'll be surprised on how many times survivors come forward, they became the hero, they held somebody accountable, then later during a court hearing or whatever social media content might be out there, I start getting calls from other victims who said, hey, listen, by the way, I saw an article that it happened to this person. Well, it also happened to me. And now all of a sudden we have more people coming forward. They often say strength is always in numbers. We can absolutely see that in history when we look at some of the more famous cases like that Bill Cosby case, sure. Epstein case, the Weinstein case, those type of cases where the survivors, they stayed quiet for a very long time because who's going to believe them? But all of a sudden, when you have those strength in numbers and you have other survivors who are coming out, out and making the same statement, they're like, well, wait a minute, maybe it wasn't just me. And, and that's powerful. Absolutely. I think sometimes there is a fear of coming forward when it's a sexually based crime because there's the fear of unknown of what's going to happen to you when you do come forward involving rape kits and that process. And I think if we can do anything through this podcast, obviously we want to encourage people to come forward, but also take some of the mystery out of what steps happen when you do report a sexual assault. If you could kind of walk us through what that process looks like. Yeah, and Elise, that's a great question. One of the first things that we look at right away um, that I look at in investigating cases is to see what evidence we have. Even if it's not a, a full-blown sexual assault, if it's a unlawful sexual contact, have, has the clothing been collected? What evidence do we need or that still may be at the scene if we know where the scene is at? If it's a full-blown sex assault where evidence can be collected through a SANE examination, do we need to get them down to the hospital? A lot of misconceptions that survivors get is, oh, as soon as it was done and the assault was finished, I took a shower. Uh, I sat in the bathtub for three hours. We can still collect evidence. Um, studies have shown that evidence, internal evidence can be collected up to seven days afterwards. And we've been successful in cases where the evidence has been there, even after a lengthy amount of time and several showers and things like that. So that's always a misconception, but we want to find out what evidence is out there first to preserve that. Do we need to collect clothing? You know, the important clothing is, isn't the clothing that you had on before the assault. It's the clothing that you put on after the assault. Because that's the transfer of DNA that we're going to get from perpetrator's DNA on your body and then the clothing that you put on after the fact. Um, so that's the clothing that we look at. And then from there, making sure that the survivors are in a good, safe place and then start giving them the options about 
providing a statement, which is next because a lot of times they feel like I don't want to come forward because I don't remember every little detail. Mm -hmm. Well, they're not expected to remember every little detail and they can't because your brain is automatically going to block some of that off. And that's just through the trauma that your brain went through. It's going to protect you first. I had a friend, unfortunately, that was victimized to the date rape drug. And I went with her to the hospital. And one thing I think might be comforting to listeners to hear is when she was in the hospital, when they were doing that exam, it was someone of the same gender as her. It was consent every step of the way. And when she said no, right. no was taken for a no in that moment. And they walked out of the room. They gave us a chance just as friends to have a moment to like, you got this. This is what we need to do. But everything was very well respected. And there was never a time where at least she felt and I felt just as a witness to it that she was pushed to do something that she wasn't yet ready to do. And it's back to the nurses, the forensic nurses that I've spoke to. It's back to giving that control that the survivor felt that they lost during the assault. Give them back some of that control, you know. And talking them through each single step. This is what we're going to do next. This is now what we're going to do next. Now we need to take photographs. No, I don't want to take photographs. Fine, we won't take photographs. Now we need to do this type of collection. I don't want you to collect that. That's fine. That's perfectly fine. It's what they're comfortable with. One of the things on, on my uh, Heroes Through Knowledge site that I created, um, I actually speak with a, uh, a uh, forensic nurse um, who leads the team. And she explains step by step the process and everything that you're talking about. The interesting thing, though, um, that I do want to tell, tell you guys is that not every hospital has the same program, has a sex assault nurse examination program, um, which is the same program, or a forensic nurse examining FNE program, which is exactly the same thing. But not every hospital has that. If it's something where your listeners are or have experienced or are allies to somebody who's experienced something like this, they may want to call around beforehand. Now, local law enforcement who respond should know the hospitals that provide that service. And I, I caution the should know. Some of them don't. Um, yeah. And it might just be something that I need a, I need a sane exam done. It just can't be a regular exam from like a gynecologist because it's a specialized exam. And these nurses, they're also trained to testify in court because of the extra training that they've taken as nurses. Even when I'm testifying in court, I can't testify to the sane exam. I've reviewed reports after reports, hundreds and hundreds of reports. I've seen plenty of documentation, but I'm not an expert in that field. They are. So that's why it just can't be any general doctor doing, a, doing an exam and collecting the evidence. That's really good to know. I'm glad you brought that up. Going through not only potentially like the physical examination and pictures and all of that, but I feel like we've taken such a big leap in the past few years. And I'm sure with you being on the force for decades, You've seen a change in how victims are treated because we have a better understanding of psychology and trauma. And I just want to know from your experience in your career, what you've seen change, but also what you hope to see change in the future to make it easier for victims to come forward. Yeah. The number one thing is just the narrative and the way it's been approached. You know, in the past, there was a lot of the judgments on the victim themselves or the acts of, you know. Well, what did they do? What did they do to cause this? You know, and, and what were they wearing? How much were they drinking? Mm -hmm. And shifting that to why are we concentrating on what the victim has done or not done and start concentrating on the perpetrator and what they did? And the biggest shift, I think, was changing that narrative to let's concentrate on what the suspect, what that perpetrator did to them. Because without the acts, there's no case and then there's no trauma, you know, and society itself. Quit victim blaming. A couple of the cases that I uh, tell when I'm in training is two of the best cases that I ever worked. Actually, one was here, was here in Colorado and another one was in Florida dealt with sex workers. And it's like, who's going to believe a sex worker? What does she do for a living? Well, she has sex for money, right? If they're coming forward, you better believe them because something happened. Yeah. And then both of these cases, these sex workers were strong. They went through the entire process. And in both cases, there was life sentences that were handed down to the perpetrator afterwards. And that was because of their strength and them becoming the heroes and them saying, I'm not doing this anymore. And not worrying about being questioned about what they did for a living in a court of law. Yes, I'm a sex worker. I get paid to have sex for money, but I do not get paid to be raped. And I do not get paid to be sexually assaulted. And this is what this man did to me. 
and it was great. It actually just gave me chills thinking about the two cases. They were fantastic individuals. Do you feel comfortable talking about those cases at all? You know, I, I could talk about them. I mean, I'm not mentioning any names or anything else like that. Case in Florida was a young lady. It's, it's, the funny thing is, the case in Florida was a young lady that when I started my patrol career, we met on the street in Florida. And I got to know her and we kind of grew up on the streets together on different sides of the block, if you can say, you know, right. <laughs> I was in law enforcement. She, she was a sex worker, but we knew each other. I then became a detective and she did specific acts and that's all that she did. And that's what I found out with a lot of sex workers is they'll do this, they'll do specific things to, to get paid, but they won't cross that line. They won't do anything different. And I recall getting a call, uh, getting called out in the middle of the night on this case and asked to go down to the hospital because this person was down in the hospital and they were being treated. And so I was called out and I got the name of the person and it was the girl that I knew from the streets. And when I walked into the room, she was beaten so bad I couldn't see her eyes and her face was completely black and blue and she didn't have any teeth anymore. The perpetrator asked for specific acts from her. She said, no, I don't do that. And this is a person that she knew going back to what we started with. She knew this person. She's had sex with this person in the past. And he says, no, this is what I want this time. And she says, no, I don't do that. And he says, well, you're going to do that. And he beat her and he jammed her face into a door jam behind a shed behind a bar where I found her teeth. Actually, when I went there and went to the crime scene. Oh, my gosh. But because she was strong enough. And um, I think some of it was the rapport that her and I had when she seen me walk in that room that uh, she goes, he's not going to get away with this. And she was strong during the entire case. And we got him convicted for life because of her being a hero. It changed her life. It really changed her life. She ended up moving away. Her family was out of state. They ended up taking her in. She kind of changed her lifestyle a little bit. But, you know, she didn't let what happened to her define her. And she didn't allow this guy to get away with it. And the second case was very similar. It was a sex worker here in Colorado. She was picked up by a John. The exchange of money was discussed. He wasn't going to have any part of that. He ended up holding a gun to her. He ended up brutally raping her in three different locations while in his vehicle. She is able to fight and get away in the middle of February in Colorado, where we have her on a ring camera running down the street naked, trying to get away from this individual, which she was able to. And because of her strength, we were able, I was able to identify who the suspect was and he was held accountable and he was also convicted and sentenced to many, many years in jail where he will not get out before he's dead. Wow. Those are two incredible women. I have goosebumps, truly. I get emotional every time we talk about this kind of stuff, but hearing that you say like narrative is changing is so important because Obviously, Annie and I have no law enforcement experience, but when we cover these cases, even when I go back 30 years and I'm researching a case, the way that it is talked about during like the court transcripts when, it, when sexual assault is included, it is almost like victim blaming even in the court testimony. And so I'm glad to hear that, that narrative has shifted, that we understand a little bit more about consent. But going forward, what is something that you as someone with all of these years of experience is it just that we continue to shift that blame or is there another avenue that you think that we need to work on as a society or as law enforcement to make sure that victims feel comfortable coming forward? Yeah, Elise, and I think, again, another great question, but this is what I, I would have to say. You know, we, years ago, we went to the Start By Believing campaign, if you guys recall that, mm -hmm. um, but it's not so much Start By Believing. And this goes not only for law enforcement, for the DA's office, but it also goes for family, friends, your allies, your next door neighbor, people that know you. We need to start by listening. We need to shut our mouths. And when a victim or survivor is speaking, we need to listen because they have a story to tell. And let's not judge on anything of that happened. Just we need to be quiet and we need to listen to their story because they have a story. And when people actually sit down and listen it without forming opinions or judgments right away, then we start maybe understanding a little bit about what they want to. Nobody can ever know what they want to um, at all because every single person deals with it differently. Every single case is different, right? But we won't know that if we don't just shut our mouths and listen. And we need to start listening and we need to start hearing what they're saying. Because again, as I've told others through, through training and things, tomorrow that person could be somebody you know. Could be your mother, your sister, your aunt, your grandmother, your uncle, your son. Let's be quiet and let's listen to what they have to say. And that is truly 
what I would hope for is that in general, everybody closes their mouth and listens to what that person, that hero, that survivor needs to tell us. I think that is incredible advice, not only to our listeners, but to people that may not have gotten the training that you've gotten over the years and seen this firsthand over and over and over again and how repetitive, not necessarily the crimes are, but the victims' responses to it are. And I hope our listeners would be a safe ear for people to come forward and talk to them. We had a listener actually write in and she asked, how can I be an ally if someone comes to her and says, this happened to me? How do you approach it and not, you know, go, oh my gosh, and start panicking? Because I feel like that's what I would do. I'd immediately start panicking. I would start crying. I'd be a hysterical mess. How can someone go, okay, you're in a safe spot. Here's what I'm going to do to help you. I think the first thing we need to look at is that why is that person coming forward to tell you first of all? It's because they trust you, right? And if they are going to trust you with something as intimate and as scary and frightening that this is to you, again, it goes back to you need to just listen to what they have to say and then ask them what they want to do. And as an ally, have some of those options for them. Do you want to go to the hospital? I'll come with you. Do you want to talk to law enforcement? I'll come with you. Tell me what you want to do. Instead of saying, you need to go to the hospital, you need, we need to call the police, we need to do this. Well, where are we, where's the control then? It's no longer in their hands. It's now in the hands of somebody trying to make a decision for them. And it, it shouldn't be because when we start doing that and what I've seen um, in past is that person that relied on you and that confided in you on the most horrific thing that ever happened to them, all of a sudden shuts down. And not only have you lost that person's trust, but that person may never open up again. So support them on however they want to be supported. And they may not know. And if they don't know, there's a lot of great websites out there that they can go to that can answer some of these questions. Of course, my being one, mine being one of them as well. You talked about the seven day. You can still get evidence from clothes after seven days. What if it's been like a couple of years and someone finally feels like, okay, I can talk about this. What does that look like? So I'm sure it's a little bit different. There's not DNA evidence. There's not clothing evidence. Can you go into that a little bit? Right. Well, and, and to go back to seven day, Annie was, um, that was specifically surrounded about uh, around stain exams. Cause normally after that, the chances of getting any kind of internal DNA, uh, from the suspect starts to really fall off quickly. You know, yeah. got, we have gotten it in some cases up to 10, but a lot of times it, it's jurisdictional wide, wide also. You know, depending on what that hospital and what that police department has come up with as far as what their threshold is. But in general, the average is seven days across at least the country. Got it. Good to know. Thank you. When it comes to clothing, as long as the clothing hasn't been washed or hasn't been put in a plastic bag, and that's the important thing, no plastic. Plastic forms condensation, which then destroys everything that's in it. Interesting. As long as it's been like a paper bag. Or it's just been placed somewhere and no one's touched it. Possibly we can still get evidence off of that. Law and Order SVU has lied to us. No plastic bag. <laughs> this is not Hollywood. You know what? It's funny, at least because I'm glad you brought that up. I often tell the survivors that I speak to that this is not television. This is not Hollywood. We're not going to solve this case in 45 minutes with commercial breaks. And I'm not going to get my, D my DNA results back from that, you know, <laughs> which are automatically going to show up and tell me who right. the guy is and where he lives and everything else and <laughs> have the SWAT team beating down his door. That's just not reality. It really isn't. A lot of times DNA, and this is important, I think, um, to understand, DNA takes an extremely long amount of time. At one point, we waited almost a year and a half just to get DNA back. Wow. I mean, it's gotten a lot better. It's gotten to be where it's in the three months or if it's a rush because maybe we're talking about a serial rapist. So they put a rush on the labs and stuff. We can get it back sooner than that. But it's still a very lengthy process. It's something that just doesn't happen quickly. I know every state is going to be different, but is there a statute of limitations when it comes to sexual assault for people to come forward? Every state has a different statute of limitations because they all make their own laws. And I wish they wouldn't. I really don't because... The laws and the penalties you see in one state could be really strong. And then you go to another state and they're extremely weak for no rhyme or reason, because it gives that state that threshold. The statute of limitations for every single type of case in every single state. So depending on the type of case that it is too, the statute of limitations could be there 
And this is what I also want to share with your listeners. Just because a statute of limitations has expired doesn't mean they can't still report. And the reason why is I'll give you an example, Bill Cosby. There's several, I believe 72 women that were affected in the Bill Cosby trial. And one woman was in the statute of limitations. Just because it's something that can no longer be prosecutable due to the statute of limitations when it happened, it doesn't mean it can still be brought up to court to show the pattern of conduct of this perpetrator. He continued to do the same thing over and over and over again. That's a really good point. You've talked a little bit about your website. I did my homework. I was browsing it. It is fantastic. <laughs> We're going to link it for our listeners. There was one section I really was drawn to about consent. What does consent mean to you and what does it mean to our listeners? That's an interesting question. And during my journey of creating the website that I did and through my time and working with these cases, I became good friends with founder of CAN, which is Consent Awareness Network. And she's, her name is Joyce Short and she's out of New York. And she's actually on a mission to change the definition of consent in our laws. Because the difference between consent, the way you and I look at consent, you know, my definition of consent as a personal being is that if it's not a strong yes, it's a no. But we all know that there's a lot of variations to that, right? I mean, a lot of gray area. When jury members ask for the definition of consent in legal terms, it gets very convoluted. And to the fact that we're during a jury trial, Bill Cosby, when it was a hung jury on the first trial that he had, if you recall, it's because they couldn't define consent. And because a jury member asked the judge, hey, could you define consent for us? And the judge's answer was, well, you're all grown people. You figure it out. Oh, my gosh. Even in Colorado, when it comes down to jury instruction and a definition of consent, I read it. And as long as I've been in law enforcement, I don't understand it. Joyce Short up in New York, she simply defines consent as freely given, knowledgeable, informed agreement between two people with the emphasis on freely given. You know, freely given doesn't mean that you're at a bar and you're wasted and you're freely given consent. It's freely given, knowledgeable, informed decision between two individuals. And that's great. That's simple. We're actually trying to help each other to just change the legislation so that eventually we can have that go countrywide instead of just state by state. So Well, and like you said, there's so much gray areas. Well, she was drunk, but so was I. Well, we've hooked up before, so why would I think it was different this time? And so I think it's so commendable that you guys are partnering to kind of change, like you said, not only jury instruction, but legislative laws around this of what does consent really mean? Because even in the cases we cover, or the cases I see on the news, and I'm like, oh no. And I get that worried feeling of that gray area where she's like, yeah, I was at a party. Yeah, I was drunk. I was blackout. I didn't remember it till the next day. And then everyone's, you know, kind of doing that victim blaming thing of maybe you said yes in the moment, but you weren't, like you said, knowledgeable enough in that moment to freely give consent. So I think that is so admirable that you guys are trying to change that and really make it, this is what it is. And there is no gray area when you say they have to be fully knowledgeable and have full capabilities and wits about them to give consent, regardless if it's a partner or not. And it goes back to the two cases that I spoke about with the sex workers. They consented to have sex with these individuals, these perpetrators, right? But what happened? Somewhere during the acts which they consented to, it turned. Mm -hmm. That consent was withdrawn. Once that consent's withdrawn, it's done. It's not, well, wait a minute, I'm going to finish up. I'm almost done. It's not any of that. It's, it's, it's done. Or if it comes down to a fact of, you know, you're out with your friends and they know that you're trashed, but you're hanging out with this one guy and they're worried about you, go and intercept them. Intercept your yeah. friends because it'll be the greatest thing that you can do for them. Rather than just saying, oh, she's too drunk. I'm not going to deal with her. You know, as in society, are we trying to tell girls, well, wait a minute, guys can go on out and they can get trashed, but girls can't because they have to watch every movement that they make. Oh, they have to be careful what they wear. They have to be careful how they act. Oh, they walked over, they touched the guy's shoulder, so they must have liked him and wanted it. No, no, that's not the society that we should be living in. Amen. It, it's, yeah. it's, it's the consent. Do we consent to this act knowledgeably? And are we informed with what's about to happen? And if the answer is no, it's no. Get a number, call him tomorrow. <laughs> Life advice right there. You know, send him a Gatorade, be a gentleman. <laughs> Realize that, you know, sex crimes are not gender based. But, you know, if you want to be a real good gentleman, send a Gatorade. 
<laughs> and your phone number <laughs> and then leave them the hell alone. <laughs> you know, Lisa, and I'm glad you actually brought up that because the, uh, the homosexual community or the gay community, they are less apt to report a sex assault because of the stigma, because of the status, because of, you know, oh, well, if I was sexually assaulted by another man, what are they going to think of me? Now they're going to think that I'm gay. The uh, uh, LGBTQ community, they struggle with this all the time because they're afraid to come forward. You know, how am I going to be judged? I'm a transgender person. Who's going to believe me? I'm a crossdresser. Who's going to believe me? Well, we all should be believing you. But unfortunately, the statistics of coming forward decrease significantly in that community. And it's a shame because it shouldn't. To go back to what we talked about before of how we've seen victim blaming shift, or you've seen it, I've seen it in cases that I've covered as far as verbiage around these cases, but you're talking about seeing it firsthand, that maybe that's the next step is regardless of your genitalia, regardless of what you identify as, just regardless of who you are, what you do as a profession, what is between your legs, who the heck cares besides we want to care to get you help. And so maybe that is what the change needs to be going forward is we understand now more than ever, I hope, that regardless of how people identify, that they are just humans that are hurting. And that is how I think that they should be treated when a sexual assault of any level is perpetrated on them, is they are just a human that has been hurt. That's great advice because why are they coming forward? Because something did happen, right? Mm -hmm. People ask me this all the time too. They said, What's the st statistics of the people that come and they just do it because they're trying to get back at the guy and, or the girl and nothing ever happened? That statistic is so, so low. That happens so rarely that it's not, we can't even discuss it. Does it happen? It does happen. But if that's a job in law enforcement to say, okay, well, then this didn't happen. And through your investigation, that's how you figure that out. But it's so seldom that, uh, again, it comes down to Keep our mouth shut. Let's listen to what they have to say and listen to the story that they have to tell because they're coming to you for a reason, whether it's law enforcement or whether it's one of their allies, friends, family members, church members, whoever they're coming to. Annie showed me your website. We're obviously going to link it in our show notes. We're going to put it all over Instagram, heroesthroughknowledge.com. Can you speak a little bit about how this mission came about and why you wanted to start this website? Yeah, I think number one, it was just the questions that I was getting all the time from the ones who were coming forward, from the survivors that were coming forward on whether it was a sexual-based crime, like a harassment or a full-blown sex assault, and not understanding that process and having that need to say, well, wait a minute, there's got to be somewhere that they can go to. They got to be a site that they can go to that hopefully I can give them a pathway to decide what direction they want to take along with giving them the knowledge of saying, okay, well, if I do a SANE exam, I know this is what's going to, this should be what happens. If I do a police interview, this should be the way it goes. You know, can I collect my clothing? Can I do that? So I just felt that it was a need to make everybody, whether you're a survivor or whether you're an ally of a survivor or a friend or family member of a survivor, that knowledge so that they can make that informed decision to take that pathway, to step forward and say, you know what, enough is enough. I'm going to be a hero. I'm going to stand up for myself and I'm going to stand up for others by holding others, more importantly, the perpetrator accountable. That's incredible. You have definitely found your calling in life. Like Elise said, we will link that out because there's some amazing resources on there. I was on there for a long time, so great job, Steve. But to finish up, because like I said, I could talk to you all day. I'm about to be a mom. Congratulations. Thank you. I look at what's available now at kids and teenagers' fingertips, TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat. In this day and age where technology gives so much power to a younger generation, how can parents protect their kids, right? I don't want to be overbearing by any means. But what are some warning signs, maybe some behavioral changes well, my feeling, being a father myself, my feeling is that nobody knows their, their children like their parents and like their mothers, right? And so the change of behavior, whether it could be something that's because they're becoming a teenager or a juvenile, it's something different. Pay attention to that. You know, if the happy-go-lucky person is now all of a sudden silent, that's the reason why. And give them the freedom because they're going to get it anyways. Whether it's, hey, mom allowed me to go on TikTok and Instagram and all those other sites. But also hold them accountable for it by saying, hey, let me look mm -hmm. at what you're looking at. 
and have those open conversations. And that's, I think, key is for parents to have those open conversations with kids, especially um, younger kids, you know, how your body is precious. Don't be taking pictures of your body and sending them to your boyfriend or girlfriend because you love them this week. Now, next week, you don't love them. Well, guess, guess what? Right. Those pictures are already out there in the World Wide Web. And to have those open conversations of saying, this is what happens if you do this. You leave the line of communication open. You know, if you need something from me, please let me know because I'm going to keep asking you. I'm going to bother you and bother you. So just come to me first. Don't get information from TikTok or Instagram or from your friends. Talk to the people that truly love you and the people that are going to care about what happens to you. That would be my advice. Yeah, that's great advice. And congratulations on your baby. Thank you. To kind of piggyback off that, when I knew I was going to be having this conversation with you, I actually called my parents and I said, because I'm not a parent myself, but unfortunately I went through some not so great things when I was young. And now as an adult, my parents and I have had conversations around that and how my behavior really did change. And at first, like you said, they thought, ah, she's being a teenager, she's going through puberty, she's being annoying. <laughs> but when I finally confided to them like 10 years later about what was going on during that time, I just really remember my mom saying, oh, this all makes sense. And so to not have that moment for other parents of, oh, this all makes sense, 10 years past, from your experience, what are some of the behaviors that victims of sexual assault at any level exhibit maybe to the people around them if they're not coming forward and telling them, but people that have been silenced by what has happened to them. Well, I think that's exactly, you put it, you hit that on the head. One of the main things that I've seen and I've heard from their friends and family when I go and interview them, because maybe they want to cry witness, is they say, you know, we are wondering why she got so, so, so quiet. We wonder why she changed her behavior. We wondering why she was upset every time she went to work, why she lost all this weight or she gained all this weight or she, she changed her normal behaviors, which everyone's it's completely entitled to change the behaviors that they have. Maybe they just don't like the behaviors that they're doing. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But is it a reason of us of doing this for myself or is it an underlining reason because I'm trying to hide something, I'm asked something that actually happened to me? Again, look at the person that you're used to seeing and then look at who they'll be coming and saying, why, why is this happening? Is there something you want to talk to me about? Is there something, you know, without prying too much, you know, because ultimately... When they're ready to come forward, hopefully they come forward. And a lot of times, and what I try to tell the parents, don't be upset if your child confides in somebody else before they confide in you, because that probably will happen. They'll probably confide in a friend or maybe another relative before they will confide in you because they're afraid of your reaction, good, bad, or indifferent. When again, it comes down to, I need to listen to what my child is saying. I need to listen to what they're explaining to me without judgment and let them make their decisions. So well put, truly. Not really sure how to end this, except to say thank you so much for your time. Again, listeners, the website is www.heroesthrough, and that's T-H-R-U, knowledge.com. Steve, thank you so much, not only for your wisdom, but your insight and for what you're doing for the community that Annie and I live in, Denver. But hopefully as you partner to change legislation and jury instructions, hopefully it's something that we see across the board, but we cannot thank you enough for your time and your willingness to do this. I do have one last question. It's an easy one, I hope. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Having such a very hard emotional career, because I could not do what you do. I know this. I'm not born for this profession, but you clearly are. What is your one vice that you have when the day has been too much and you need to like relax or indulge in a food? What What's the vice that gets you through the day? Oh boy. Um, well, I like working out. Even though I'm getting up in age, I can't do what I used to be able to do, <laughs> unfortunately. And sometimes just disconnecting, mm -hmm. just coming home, disconnecting and trying not to think about what just happened or what's happened at work or what what I'm going through. And I think over time, you just develop that. You just say, okay, you know, this sucks, but now I got to disconnect for a little bit. Because if I, if you don't disconnect and if you don't do that, you're not going to be very well suited the next day when somebody else walks in that door and asks for your help. And really, honestly, Elise and Annie, the strength that I get is from the people I talk to. It really is. It's from the survivors, their allies, people who've come forward. Um, and then when they're done, they're saying, wow, thank you for, you know, sharing all that information for me. 
knowing that I provided some guidance for their pathway, for their decisions, makes it a lot easier for me to move forward to say, okay, let's, let's shoot it for another one. But um, I want to leave with this. I cannot do what I do without your listeners, without you, Annie and Elise, without others. I, I can't. Um, my site would not be nothing without the heroes that have come forward in the past. And my goal, hopefully, to have others come forward if they've ever questioned, should I, could I, would I, please, please take that next step when you're ready. I just want to, again, thank Steve so much for coming on. We know that that man is, I hate to say it, but unfortunately very busy. I wish he was a lot less busy in his career, but we appreciate his time. And I know that I learned a lot from him speaking to us, just even about evidence, because I talked about I've sat through this with my friends at the hospital. And I know that they were saying some of the same things he was of, oh, I took a shower. I just wanted to like cleanse myself of this. And to know that that doesn't limit you from coming forward or things like not putting evidence in a plastic bag. Like who knew? All over TV. Their lids bags are clear Ziploc looking things. I had no idea. So I want to stress that I would really hope that anyone, regardless of age, gender, sexuality, whatever the case, please take a moment to go learn even more than we could possibly ever cover in this episode. Again, his website is www.heroesthroughknowledge.com. That's through T-H-R-U. We will have it in our show notes. But I just applaud him not only for the work he's doing, but the changes that he's trying to make that will make it so much easier for victims not only to come forward, but to be believed. Yeah, he's such a great guy. I love that he called, you know, victims heroes because truly that's what they are. My biggest takeaway was how to be a friend in that moment, whether it's your family member coming forward or your friend or maybe someone who you aren't super close with and they come to you and confide in you and say, here's what happened. Give them the power. That just stood with me so much. And just listen, let them tell their side of the story, help them, but also make sure that at the end of the day, they have gained that control back. Heavy episode, but I have a lot of good takeaways and I hope our listeners do too. I just hope that whether this is something that has happened to you, our listener, been to someone that you know, that you are comforted that this is a a shared experience, even though I wish it wasn't, and that there is help available to you. We talked about specifically the law enforcement side of this and the criminal side of this, but there's also a lot of other avenues to help. And I want to refer people back to our episode with Alice. Unfortunately, we had some issues with audio during that recording, but I still think it is worth listening. I will put it in the show notes because she talks about trauma and trauma is not exclusive to one type of abuse. So I want to encourage you guys, if this is something that you have dealt with, whether you've come forward or not, that you are empowered to not only come forward with your story, but also take take the next steps in your recovery, whether that is healing physical trauma, healing emotional trauma, learning to trust the world around you again. But we are so happy to have you guys here. As always, you can find us on Instagram at a case of the Sunday scaries and on YouTube backslash the at sign case of the Sunday scaries. I would appreciate so much if those that have listened who have been with us for a while, take a moment out of your day to rate, review, subscribe on whatever platform you are listening or watching us on. It truly does help us grow this podcast and get messages like Steve's out to a bigger population. So with that said, we will be back next Sunday. Hopefully Annie will not be here. Because this episode We'll see. (laughs) No, I'm saying no. We're going to take bets on when this baby (laughs) is coming. But hopefully Annie will not be joining us for the next episode because she will be taking a new journey into motherhood. But I will be back here every Sunday. But as always, until then.